for coming to my talk. Uh, and so we're developer from Colombia. Um, I work for a Colombian company called 7 4 n And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, our experience so far doing Scala. So I'm going to start giving you some context. <coughs> um, like five years ago in my country, most of our engineers have only uh, Java experience. And they have been built in monolithic applications. So uh, this approach back then uh, was enough to tackle the business complexity down. But our economy started to become an emerging market. Uh, business processes went more complex. S uh, they had new needs to create a, a business value faster. Uh, which meant that this traditional approach uh, is sort of being appropriate to, to face these business news needs. So we need to start to looking for uh, new approaches and practices to address those concerns. So in, in our research, we've, we need to, to, to tackle this increasing business complexity. Uh, we found that functional programming removes uh, an important part of that complexity. That is the need for for the account the previous executions that serve a certain part of the program to a certain state. Since, as you know, uh, pure uh, functions only give take data and give you data back. So, in this way, we can remove this part of the complexity. Um, yeah. Uh, also, using immutability, we can also remove that the complexity that came from uh, to deal with with a mutable state. Uh, through type safety, uh, we can use the the type a uh, certain type system and takes advantage of the type checker to help the program is to, to find certain errors sooner, certain kind of errors sooner in compilation time. <laughs> but sometimes when functional programming can develop certain terminology, uh, they can move our unexpected complexity. Uh, for instance, maybe you are familiar with all these parents. Anyone? <laughs> OK, no worries. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's like uh, brain cancer diagnosis, maybe. <laughs> so we came to realize that functional programming is not just, uh, as you see, just a learning new language. And uh, this paradigm is still foreign to many engineers in, in my country, that is. I think uh, in other countries have the same problem. Uh, so we decided to, to translate in the previous note that we had from object oriented programming to to uh, to meet functional programming. So we found that all these audio oriented principles and patterns can be translated to simple functions, right? Uh, but with, uh, in this transition, we found uh, a new challenge to overcome. So as we need to keep uh, delivering business value uh, through high quality software products during this learning process. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Something happened here. OK. Uh, also, we, we have to, to onboard the new team members in these new paradigms and practices in a reasonable time frame. Uh, but we have a lack of experts or uh, people with new actually new uh, doing functional programming. And we also we have to uh, stop doing just better Java and start to take advantage of functional programming to increase the correctness guarantees to the tight system and improve the core reliability and stability, as we are going to see in a moment. And finally, we have to find a, a way to to manage this knowledge that we are having about functional programming. Our approach to, first 
to face this challenge and met the structural requirement that we have in, in the company. We are start uh, to implement a built-in approach to have uh, fire garden control over architectural decisions and the design is implementations. Uh, we also we have to have the codes as the only doc documentation. Um, easy to evolve artifacts to to keep the, that code. We everyone in the team can contribute to in a little way. Uh, in this uh, scenario, uh, framework is passing enough to tackle, uh, to overcome this challenge. So we need more fre more flexibility and start building a uh, base service to set it up as uh, our reference architecture. So our reference architecture is just uh, the code in which an interested party can refer to for the best practice of the common standard that we are working on. Um, we wanted that this architecture show how to combine different parties and uh, uh, these new approaches uh, and try the also the cultural requirements that we have in the past. So we are in, in our process we start to breaking down uh, a complex domain, business domain into multiple bonding contexts uh, using all the DD strategic parents. And here we found that this is a natural correlation. Yeah. Um, between uh, these context boundaries and and the <coughs> and the service itself. Uh, we help us to find well which part of, the, of their service will use CircuitRS uh, without adding significant complexity, and also uh, we this in this way we can separate the load that comes from the reads and the writes for the business process. Uh, we can scale each of these parts independently. Then we focus uh, on the domains verbs. Sorry, in the domains nouns, to starting with our simple types and composing them to ADTs. And for the domains uh, operations and the dom domains verbs, we start using declaring the uh, domain specific language uh, to that looks final to express uh, all the business workflows we use in this pattern. In this way, we, we are allowed to have um, uh, adding certain uh, architectural styles to separate different concerns in, in the, the implementation of the specific service. In using all these practices, we have uh, the ability to de decouple uh, this, the responsibilities between the components. And also, we have uh, certain ledgers that will be agnostic for the most external ones, uh, allowing us to have more purity in the core of our architecture. So this is uh, the architectural view of our microservice. Here in the green ledger, we have the domain model. Uh, in DDD Lingua, uh, we, we find only the entities and aggregates uh, of this domain. In the web ledger, we will find the domain services, uh, all the set of functions that operate in that in the business domain. And finally, in the view ledger, we will find the required machinery to receive events from the outside board and transform them into uh, messages that the service can use. Okay? So, I will show you some part of the code to get you familiar how uh, what one of the service should use like. Okay, is this one size okay for everyone? So I'm going to start with the um, 
this is the main. Uh, this is a, a lightweight version or a subscription service for for a certain user. Um, so, uh, as you can see, uh, we are starting to only to declaring the the aggregates of the domain using taking advantage of the types of the type system um, as much as we can. For example, we have this subscription state using uh, this code. Uh, we are using this to bound the the, the user's uh, account, the user subscription state, to make uh, like uh, the 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 states that are not going legal in into this domain will make an unrepresentable size uh, you can code actually at the state that is not here, and actually you can also control the this life cycle to go into one time to another. Uh, without so this is mostly uh, in tight level. You can set the business rules about the, the subscription life cycle. Then we are using this kind of <coughs> Uh, smart constructors to validate all, all the requirements to have an, an, an actually only we able to create a valid aggregate. So we are in exposing this apply method to create a, a user. So you can create a user that is not complying about all the business rules that we have. Then we have uh, actually modeling uh, the domain's errors in to mo more types instead of just declaring only the exceptions. So in this way, you can have uh, a close semantic to the actually the, the business uh, the information that you already have. And then we have the, the algebra, uh, the um, all the functions that we need to, to to represent a business workflow. In this case, is the life cycle for a user and the subscription. This is only like a crude implementation. Uh, we are using tagless here to be able to separate the, um, the implementation from the interpretation. And uh, this gives you the ability to to write uh, more readable codes and test it in a faster way. And also to have a uh, local reasoning as you do know, have to think about the concerns in which this effort is or how to go into composing is only pure logic based uh, on the on the business domain that you have. Then we have a program here. This program uh, plays as, uh, as a command in SecureRS. So science is handled, is orchestrating all the algebras for the domain and also dealing with the consequences of this process. Sending all, all the, the consequences to Kafka as an, uh, a, as an event. Uh, notice that here we can actually compose different algebras, the user algebra that for the member life cycle and the event algebra. Here only we are sending events to Kafka. And finally, I have mm, a repository. This repository acts as interpreter for the previous program and set the effect to a monist task. Um, here, this task has the effect to be a lazy, lazy asynchronous computations. And also, we are using closely arrows to enable uh, dependency injection here. Uh, this also gives us the capability to defer all the executions to the last part of the program in the main part. Uh, <coughs> uh, in here, in this user constant, 
context, uh, we are injecting all the necessary dependencies for configuration to the database and the Kafka producer. So now we are showing you a port. Here uh, I have a gRPC port to expose the, the service of this domain. Uh, this port only needs the the required algebras and one interpreter. And here we set all the the effects and the side effects required to this port to actually be able to communicate with the outside world. So as, that's as we hear, we had these necessary evils to be able to to communicate over HTTP2. And we also have the, the composition through the uh, interpreter and the actual program under certain effect. With this kind of coding, you can also create and simple threads to do your business logic. As you we only need an interpreter for the algebra that you want you want to test. Here I'm testing the previous algebra using ID Monad, which is the effect of not having an effect actually. And I interpreted the the this create user program through that effect uh, on their ID mona. Notice that actually the interpreters can be a monadic context itself. This means that you can compose different interpreters on the same program at once. Uh, for example, if you need to log in or search certain times for observability, like tracing or matrix, you can compose these interpreters with uh, the task interpreter to have all them via a flat map. And you can grow up this application in an easy way as well. OK. Um, Hence the final thoughts as conclusions for this. Uh, we found that it's extraordinarily complex to get simple in our approaches. So we also find that the, the structure that you can build uh, can have intrinsic complexity codes. So growing up in instructions can be um, as dangerous as don't, don't have any instructions at all. Uh, so we, for that is we keep the student to find a better way to do to do it, this. Uh, also, all the decisions that we made in about this process was focused on, on people to make the labor, daily labor easier. And we can have uh, certain measures of success of this approach, which is we uh, achieved to reduce the mean time to add new features to a service. Uh, we have less books uh, on production. Uh, we can create texts and find book for find certain errors sooner. So thank you. <laughs> so if you have any questions? Yes? Uh, with the previous projects that we have, uh, we have uh, certain records about how many books we have we find in there in between <coughs> all releases, like uh, f certain three months, more, most or less. And we have uh, basically data about how a project we go down back then, and how it's going now with using Scala and functional programming. And the numbers just decrease for the back part in a very notorious <coughs> way. So that's how we do that. Anything else? OK, thank you very much.